Welcome to episode five, which is a bit of a first for me. So during COVID, I met today's guest. I hope that this will be a first of many web shows that I'm able to do with her because my little corner of the interwebs should be aware of Deborah Davis, known to her friends as Dee Dee. So this episode of the Edinburgh Fringe is not about the Edinburgh Fringe because the episode is titled Elsewhere, not the Edinburgh Fringe, episode five. So whilst the Fringe has been in full swing, the arts and cultural establishment has not been asleep in the rest of the world or even the UK. So my guest today is Dee Dee. Um, she's an artist who explores the notion of power and violence and inequality in society, as well as the boundaries that we need to set ourselves. And we're going to talk a little bit about boundaries, but also about hope and certainty and connection. Dee Dee this year has a sculptural installation in the Wells Art Contemporary, it's entitled Hostile. And the Wells Art Contemporary shares a similar calendar slot to the Edinburgh Fringe. So it runs from July the 30th to this Sunday coming, the 28th of August. In addition, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the artists that are exhibiting, or at least the numbers of this uh, exhibition. So this year, the exhibition received 3,200 submissions, 1,600 creatives hailing from 47 countries. And from those shortlisted, they picked 29 site-specific installations to actually be installed at Wells Art Contemporary. And Dee Dee is one of those. So I would like to welcome on screen um, Dee Dee. Here we go, let's have a chat. Hello. Hi there. I just, um, before, before we start, I just have to say that it wasn't just 29 installations that were chosen. Uh -huh. um, it, the, the, um, the, sh the exhibition, comprises of 2D work and small sculptures uh -huh. and installations. And I think there was roughly 120 in the category of small sculptures and... Yeah. Um, so tell uh, us, as I say, you're, you're at Wells Contemporary this year and this this is your piece. So tell is us... Is my piece, is my piece this year. Um, so just a little bit about Wells Art Contemporary, what I... Hmm did um, an MA in Fine Art at the University for Creative Arts from 2016 to 2018. And um, your course, I mean, they, they, they do what they can to prepare you for the, the world of art. And so they uh, would uh, encourage you to enter call outs, which is, um, there's various platforms you could submit through. Um, the organizer or the art curator or the group puts out a call on places like um, Curator Space or AN and uh, there's so many platforms and um, they ask for submissions you have to pay a small amount of money admin charge and then there's a selection process and um, of all the ones that you can enter there's hundreds and hundreds you could enter um, the Wells Art Contemporary was the one where your tutor would sort of chase you down the corridor and go, it's it's um, a deadline tomorrow. Have you submitted? Have you submitted? So it's actually on the sort of arts calendar. It's it's one that's up there, you know. And, and there are a lot of people who are exhibiting who are members of um, uh, the Royal, Royal Society of Sculptors. Mm. Um, and so you can check out, as I say, we've got the, the your website is there as a QR code uh, if people want to check out Dee Dee's work. Yes. But also, if you want to look at what else is on at the Contemporary, um, do check that um, QR code as well, because your yeah. work is in the main space. So from what you've said about how you were chased to submit things, yeah. as an artist, 
do you feel you've arrived? What What is your career? Where are you at the moment? Where do you feel you are? Where do you want to go? And where have you come from? Just tell yeah. us a little bit about your art career. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes I really envy people who want to be doctors or lawyers or teachers or plumbers or whatever it is that they want to be, because it seems to me that if you choose anything other than being an artist, there is this sort of path that you follow, you know, I do this and then I do that and then I'll take this exam and then I go and work here and then if I work there, then maybe I'll make partner or maybe, you know, I'll decide that actually I really love doing this, I'll set up my own business or I don't like it and I'll go and do something else, whereas there isn't really a career path for being an artist. Well, if there is one and anybody's listening, please do contact me. And so it's this, because art is so subjective, it's kind of, you're really kind of, um, well, actually, I, I don't even know what I would define as success. Um, at the moment, I think there are stages. So I think at the moment, I would absolutely love it if, when people exhibit my work, it doesn't actually cost me any money to get it there. I'm kind of at that stage where I just think, I've made the art, I would always have made the art, but now it's gonna cost me money to transport it there. Yes, it's the ultimate sale, isn't it? You don't really see any return on it in business terms. You don't see a return on investment in what you've invested into a piece that might get exhibited until it sells, until you sell your work. So. True. And also, I think, I mean, there's various, various models, isn't there? So some people, if you just keep producing work, which is probably the path I'm taking, if you keep producing work and people know what work you produce, then what they might do is they might commission you to make a piece or you might be you might be uh, on people's radar so that when you apply for funding, you've got some credibility. Mm. Um, and if you were going to... Uh, finance that art piece yourself to have mm. somebody else say that they're going to you they've got some funding um and then I guess what happens is you, you just keep going and then one day you're a bit like Picasso or Tracy Emin where you just scribble some or Andy Warhol or whoever where you just scribble something down on a napkin in a restaurant yeah. back in the matchbox so I mean this and, isn't this isn't the first year you've done Wells Contemporary so Tell well, me a bit of a story year. about, so this is a piece that I knew that you had created before Wells Contemporary. You'd had photographs of it uh, built in full and in various. Yeah. Different. So tell us a little about this and maybe a bit about what went into it. And, and so, you know, you don't have to go into costs exactly, but what in, what what's entailed with getting this piece around and getting it to Wells Contemporary and, and, and its evolution? Okay, so um, the picture you're seeing at the moment, I'll just explain. It's made from construction timber and um, it is 8.4 metres tall. And oh, no, it's not actually. It's slight, slightly lower than that. It's 8.4 metres tall when it's fully, um, when it's assembled slightly differently. Um, and um, it is of the Statue of Liberty in the state of collapse. So you can probably make out the face and the crown. And um, this was the piece that I did at the end of my two years part time doing a master's in fine art. And um, although I was producing other work over those two years, some work in really quick succession, this was my main project, um, which uh, would not have got built if I hadn't collaborated with um, a guy called Stuart French, who um, uh, is, well, I was going to say he's a builder by trade, but he's more than that. I mean, he's just, uh, he can do everything, basically. So he's um, uh, he was a fabricator. He actually worked on lots of council contracts for a company where he could repair anything, really. Mm. And um, I was sharing a house with him, and I was, it was all around Trump time, 2016, 2017, and I had a matchstick kit of the Statue of Liberty. And um, basically the kit was you laid the matchsticks down and glued them all together and they had a design plan. And I basically just cut the design plan out of um, sheets of um, thin ply on a laser cutter. And I assembled like a maquette and then I was playing with making it fall down. And that actually was gonna be the art piece. 
And then um, Stuart, because slightly bonkers, said, oh, two millimetre matchsticks, um, construction timber is two by two. Why don't we make it out of two by two construction mm. timber? Gives it a whole different scale, doesn't it? A whole different scale. Oh, yeah. It's 18 times bigger yeah. than the matchstick kit. And mm. then for my degree show, and I think because I absolutely wanted to make sure that it all sort of stacked on top of each other and you could actually see it as a, as a full statue, uh, we did exhibit it that way. And then I took some panels off the back and I was trying to turn the panels into a wall. But it was only when I was actually installing it for my degree show that I realised that it wasn't going to quite work. So my actual degree show piece wasn't mm. resolved. We call it resolved. Um, and then um, I was lucky enough to have my work accepted into Millfield, which is a school that is very supportive of arts and sports. And every year they put a call out for uh, MA and postgraduates. And you know, tutors have to put pupils forward. And I got accepted into that. And they let me exhibit this. But um, I couldn't exhibit it with the base. And that's when I got a chance to experiment with it collapsing. And then I got accepted into Wells. And um, this iteration is just the best one that I've done so far. Yeah. And your, your work, even when you've created a piece, it's it's still evolving. I mean, that I, I think one of the things that I like about you as an artist is is your conscience. You're not an artist that just wants to use a medium and make something. You kind of have you know, a true sense of an artist as far as I'm concerned, which is the fact that the consciousness comes first. So, I mean, we've seen this piece. Wells is inside this time and outside. But um, I think the, the next piece just as a contrast of sort of the work that you do, um, was the Dictator Don, which sort of obviously during the, the, the rise of, of the Trump consciousness and what that meant to people who are going, where did he come from? And the inevitability of what's going on in society at the moment. Just, just this piece um, is just so lovely. So just tell, tell, just tell me about Dictator Don. It's, it's so even and... So Dictated On is a little felt effigy of Donald Trump, um, laser cut felt that I stuck together. So um, all the artwork was uh, vector files in Illustrator, which I'm self-taught and not brilliant at, but can kind of get by. And um, I have got a tiny bit of a background in electronics. I worked for University of London for five years at a place called the Centre for Creative Collaboration. And my job was to fill the building with interesting people in the hope that they would collaborate. So uh, literally my job was to go to lots of meetups, find interesting people, and then bring them back to a dedicated building that we had in King's Cross called C4CC. And, um, and then I would, my, our job, myself and um, uh, the rest of the management team was to um, create purposeful collisions between people. I think probably based, so basically we were, um, we were proving that the future of the workforce um, was creatives working with engineers, working with psychologists, working with people from lots of different disciplines, much like Apple was, you know, Apple was, you know, mm -hmm. he was design led, but he was also techie. And, you know, you, we've all seen what the combination of that is. Mm. Um, and I think that's what we were trying to foster. Anyway, this is a sort of long way around to tell you that um, <laughs> I went and found geeks. And then there were all these like amazing techie people who were making things light up and move. And there were lots of artists that were collaborating with them. And um, I just learned what I could and got other people to help me with other things so I did learn how to do a basic circuit I think on um Ms Tech was a group that was around then it's, uh, it it's sat in sort of a little cardboard packaging it's sort of a little bed didn't it because I think this is another example of a piece of artwork that yes yeah, so got realized but the what was happening in the media kind of drove how you disseminated it so just tell us a bit about when it, 
when it became alive for a second time because it kind of had okay a... so I think I think what what I do is I work backwards so I thought well if I'm going to make something what do I want to do with it do I want to exhibit it or do I want to send it people and I thought I'd like to send it people so in some ways it was a bit of a sort of merchandise really mm-hmm. although instead of it being made in China it was made in my studio and each one takes flipping ages <laughs> so if you have one you have no idea how many hours it took me to make each one um and uh, basically what it is, is a felt effigy of Donald Trump. And I've designed it in such a way that if you stab him with a pin in his wife fronts, his eyes light up. And that was my way of, well, that was my reaction to him grabbing women by the pussy. I just thought, well, I'll just stab you in the willy then. Yeah. <laughs> probably no, say oh, I'm actually too old to say mm. the word. But there you and, go. and you just you wanted to send it out to people and there's just a couple of examples here on screen of you know the, the people that had received it and then tweeted it and, and using social technologies to be able to to share your piece of artwork not you know yeah. exhibiting yeah. and sharing the consciousness of what you want to say as an as a narrative in that piece also collaborates with the audience that you're sending it to Yes. And I think um, I think I was my vision was really ambitious at the beginning. I just thought I'm going to send thousands of these out. Oh, people can buy them for cost and then we'll just have this whole army of people. But, you know, that's kind of not possible unless you have a huge distribution engine behind you and production. And um, I went to go and see somebody. I was doing my MA at the time and I went to go and see somebody. Um, about business advice and she basically just said if you really really want to do this you're going to have to stop doing your MA because this will just take up all your time and it's time limited he's not always going to be president so Mm. um, I didn't but the people that I did give it to it came with a letter and they were always people they were people who had had expressed um a dissatisfaction with Donald Trump Mm -hmm. and uh so I sent it them and I just said, look, there's no pressure. If you do want to put something out on social media, then great. And I didn't want anybody to feel obliged that they had to. And I'm also sensitive to the fact that some people just didn't want to mm. because they didn't want to draw enough att- that kind of attention to themselves. Yeah. So there's, the, you know, there's, there's that consciousness of of your work but as as an artist, you just mentioned, you know, the amount of time things take to, to build. Mm. You yeah, know, and but you a lot of artists is that compulsion to create and that compulsion to make as part of your extended um internal dialogue. And I know there's you know there's pieces that you've made. There was a um a sofa, you were on a walk, so even the world around you is is influencing things that you want to make. Oh right? yeah, that was that was because of uh COVID and lockdown though. So Mm. like everybody you're kind of going well I don't really know what to do now and there's no point contacting galleries and I can't go in my I can't go into a studio outside of you know I mean we were locked down we couldn't go anywhere Mm. and um, I was in Portugal at the time so um, I spent some of my time in Portugal I'm trying to um, get a career off the ground um, that's European rather than UK centred and um, it was one Sunday morning I was in Portugal, I couldn't go anywhere, I didn't know anybody, I hadn't connected with any artists at that point. And I said to my partner, I'm just going to go and make some art. And he said, where? And I said, outdoors. I mean, I'm not a land artist, I don't, you know, mm. as per se. So um, I, I, and I had actually got some work. I just recently had some work put in um, the Heathlands in Surrey um and I can't remember the timing of it but I think it had also then gone to Watts Gallery yeah so So I was familiar I I'd had some success doing some outdoor pieces which we can talk about actually because that's quite interesting these were were beautiful I mean this is it you know you've there's the stuff at Wells there's the Donald Trump there's um you know we're gonna look at fairy lights um, yeah it's all this but this this is sort of a, a magical connection with, you know, tell us, tell us the story behind. Well, I haven't, I haven't finished the story about the sofa yet. I'm just, yeah. that was the, this is the background to doing the sofa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went out and I found a rubbish dump. Um, there's 
uh, quite well I thought it was fly tipping in Portugal but I think it's more along the lines of we're going to dump this here by the bins and then if you want it you can take it away in a van and people in Portugal take away stuff that you wouldn't think that they would take I mean there's quite a lot of poor people um, in Portugal or people who were very good at recycling stuff I should say probably and um, they there was um, a garden uh, set uh, two chairs and a, a sofa and um, that sort of woven rattan kind of stuff and um, I don't know I just I, I, sometimes I have very specific thought processes about what I'm going to make and I just all I know that day was I was really really down and um, they have a real problem with eucalyptus trees in Portugal as well and I was thinking oh they've got a problem with fly tipping and they've got a problem with eucalyptus and I was all I'm also I was also getting really down about the environment and the fact that we're destroying the world and then what gives me hope is seeing plants creep up through pavements or climbing up a lamppost or something or the ivy that's like all over my wall and um I think I just sort of put the two problems together. I, to be honest with you, I'm not really sure I thought about it that much. And um, the next thing I knew... The spontaneity of it, though, wasn't it, as well? You know, the, the final photograph that um, that appears on your site, which we will put a link to in the show notes, um, because it's not one that we've got a slide of. So, you know, the spontaneity of having a chat. Um, it's been really it's really good just hearing about your thought process, Dee Dee. So, or just maybe the determination to actually just go and make some art rather than sitting there going, oh, well, the studios aren't open and I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do the other. It's like, well, mm. what can you do? And that's a point, you see, because lots of people say to me, oh, I'd love to be an artist, but I don't have the money and it costs money for materials. And to be honest with you, if you took away every single bit of material from me and left me with a roll of masking tape, well, I'd just make something out of masking tape. <laughs> it's like... It's like, you know, I. Yeah. it's very, very easy for us all to think that everything has to be in place before we do something. Mm. And that's not always true because create you can be creative with everything. I mean, you can be creative with your thoughts. You don't even have to make anything. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so I what I did was I took the eucalyptus leaves and I poked them all into the weave of the sofa. And I sort of ended up with a sort of hairy sofa, really. And I dragged it into the middle of the road. And I took a photograph on my iPhone. I didn't even take a proper, I didn't even take a shot on an SLR or anything. And then, um, and then I got it into an exhibition. I got it, I put it forward for an exhibition, and I got it in. And it's a beautiful piece, actually. Yeah, yeah. So that, that sort of the making things, the rattan materials that you use, are there particular? No. No, I didn't, no, I didn't, no, I didn't use the rattan material. The, the garden furniture was made of a weave, like a rattan, mm. and I managed to slot the eucalyptus leaves behind the weave of the sofa. Mm. And then, as I say, because the, the belonging piece, which is a great name for a piece, um, I mean, this is showing photos from all three. So from Hannah Peshaw, from Watts Gallery and from the Heathlands exhibition. Yeah. And the, that I did weave myself. Yes. And, yeah. And as I say, you you built those. So did you want to learn to, to craft that natural material or did you learn the skill and then the piece emerged from what you wanted to say? Because you, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that's so curious that um, there was a woman... Um, at UCA called Annette who is the most amazing basket weaver um, I mean calling her a basket weaver is actually like she's <laughs> more than that she's an artist and um, I I can't even remember why but I said to her oh I do I actually so the Heathlands every year they do an artist trail and they allow students from University for Creative Arts to submit a proposal I was alumni. I asked if I could submit something. They said yes. And it's getting back to that theme of nature fighting back. I wanted to make um, willow balls and I wanted to fill them with rubbish that was found on the Heathland because um, the call out has to reflect the Heathland. Mm -hmm. And um, so I put my proposal in and they said, well, we like your idea, 
but there's no litter on our heathland which there isn't and and then i said oh okay then well um i'll fill it with i can't remember i'll fill it with pine cones but then that would have been too many pine cones and then they said well you kind of can't really put it in because it's got to reflect the heathland which i mean is fair enough that's the theme of the flipping call out and so i went back and i just thought well hang about a minute i'm making something out of willow and it's going into an environment where admittedly willow doesn't grow but it's still nature and then i just thought well why can't they accept it on the grounds that it's about nature and then i suddenly thought well actually they're being very specific about what nature it is and willow isn't part of their nature but it is part of nature and then it just got me thinking about human beings we're all human beings but then we discriminate along the lines of male female black brown you know color mm. of our skin religion everything and then i started thinking well this is a category problem then you know um if we didn't have categories then we probably wouldn't have so many problems in the world. Um, yeah, yeah, so I rewrote my proposal and I wrote back to them and I just said, look, um, we've got a category problem here. It's part of nature, but not your nature. Um, and my piece now is, is about belonging. So it's about fitting in, but not quite fitting in, you know. And that's why I hung them the way that I did in the tree because they just look out of place, but they kind of look like they belong. And the clustering of them together means that they're kind of tight knit. Um, I was also watching, um, I was watching Stranger Things at the time as well, which kind of influenced me. And, uh, oh my goodness me, an Amazon one. It was an Amazon series, which I cannot remember the name of. And that was, that was really influencing me as well, which was sort of, sort of sci-fi really yeah it's yeah it's i mean you know sort of that piece was very rooted in nature yeah and as i say the you know sort of to to progress sort of your artwork because there's those beautiful outside in the trees looking up at stuff and then you've got um you know and then you've got another piece that you've done which was the fairy lights yeah so, so i I mean, that is one thing. I am probably quite all over the place. but And that really used to bother me. Um, but it doesn't now. It's like I didn't become an artist so that you could tell me what to do. It's yeah. like, and if I'm difficult to represent because I don't do any one particular thing and do it to death or do it to completion or exhaust it and develop it, then that isn't really what I'm doing. I'm too busy running around going, oh, I quite like that material. Oh, I quite like to do that. And oh, I like that idea. Um, and the material that's best, mm. th that I could best use to mm. um, signify or explore mm. that particular theme would be yeah. whatever, 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 whatever I'm working You never end up, do you? You never know I where- I hear what you say, because I was talking over you. Can you- oh, um, you never know where your artwork's going to end up. There's... No, I don't know what it, where it's going to end up. I don't know what materials I'm going to work with and I don't know who I'm going to work with or where it's going yeah. to go. So tell us about Fairy Lights. How did, how did this come about? So Fairy Lights came about um, uh, contacts that I'd made at the Centre for Creative Collaboration. Um, years ago, I, had, um, I met uh, who was then the CTO of uh, CTO of IBM, um, Northern Ireland and UK, and um, England and UK. I hope I've got his title right. Anyway, um, I met him as part of a group that had gone down to the Isle of Wight to hack the dinosaurs. They've got these big fiberglass dinosaurs who weren't roaring very well. And so we were doing something with the sound files. And uh, that's how I met Andy. And Andy also knew me from Sea Fox CC. And I'd been to a couple of Andy's lectures, one of which was he talks about doing a graphical output of the ferries as they cross from the Isle of Wight to the mainland, because that's the trip that he did, because he works at IBM. 
on, uh, I don't think I, my nan said men, nan said, you told me the other day, he catches the ferry from the Isle of Wight so that he can go to um, IBM Hursley, it was obviously before the pandemic, um, and he plots the ferry crossing um, and there was a graphical output on the website and it was fun. And uh, uh, the gallery uh, key, key arts on the Isle of Wight got funding from the Arts Council for an exhibition about heroes that had come from the Isle of Wight, uh, be they kings and queens, artists, uh, and they had a people's choice. And Andy Stanford Clark was voted as being the islander who had contributed to the community because of this graphical output. So uh, they said, we would like, obviously, to have something that represents you in the gallery. And uh, he said, yeah, I'd quite like to work with uh, Dee Dee, an artist, um, and we can come up with something together that represents me. And I, you know, you, know, you don't have to try too hard sometimes. And I said, well, why don't we just do what you've done in 2D, um, sorry, in 3D that you did in 2D? And then I had this kind of bit of a dilemma because I kind of knew even at that stage that Andy probably wouldn't have it in his house after it came out of the gallery. And he would probably put it in IBM, which is fine. And I have no problem working with corporates. But then there's that, that kind of, you're sort of thinking, well, if it gets put into a corporate office, doesn't it sort of just become corporate, really? And I don't kind of want to do that art either or be known for that. And also my work is about community and it is about breaking down barriers. And so in the planning of doing this, um, and it is an infinity mirror, and I'd never done an infinity mirror before, and I love the idea of doing that. So I thought, well, uh, the lights that are around the edge, uh, which are the blue ones you see at the minute, um, if I link them up to something called cheer lights, then that explores within it some of the themes that I'm interested in, which is boundaries and barriers and who's allowed and who isn't allowed to be part of it. So um, basically how cheer lights works is that um, it works with um, LEDs, basically, um, LEDs that um, are connected to the Internet. So you can buy a little microcontroller and it works through Twitter. So if you sort of get this little device and attach it to your LED. So your LEDs in this instance are in my sculpture, but you could get a little strip and stick it around a vase or you could put it in your window or you could have it plugged into your computer. I mean, anything that you use LEDs for. Yeah. Um, it connects over the internet and it, um, it works through Twitter's API. And uh, basically, if anybody anywhere in the world puts in the word hashtag cheer lights, red or green or pink or whatever, all the cheer lights in the entire world change colour. So you know, as we sit here now, we could do cheer lights green, hashtag cheer lights green, and the sculpture, which is now hanging in IBM's office, uh, headquarters at Hursley, would turn green. And I love that idea. I just, I have this sort of fantasy going on in my head that there's some person in the middle of wherever. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I love audience. Yeah engagement i mean the, the big buzzword right now is about immersive especially yeah. performance but this this kind of art that's in the world that if you know about it you can influence you can change it and you can still do that now it still works now does it it does but i mean you would never know would you because there's yeah. no cameras on it but you know you know in your heart that mm. you've Change the colour of it. Yeah. And I've been there at IBM when people have stood in front of it and gone, let's change colour. And I've gone, yeah. And I, the, the other great thing about this piece is it does actually explain some of IBM's technology to mm -hmm. clients because some I mean, technology is really, ab well, if you're not technical, it's really abstract. And it's still data-driven. Does it still take the the crossings from oh, the yeah. right? So the little LEDs move backwards and forwards. Yeah. I remember you you're telling me that they also do a thing so you know which direction they're going in? Yeah, so basically um, they have uh, the body of the boat is uh, white LED, two 
white LEDs mm -hmm. and the the front of the boat is either blue or red or depending which um company ferry it belongs to cool. and then Andy Andy Sanford Clark was going to code it because he did all the coding uh was going to code it so that the ferry that he travels on was going to be purple or something which was quite <laughs> good <laughs> Um, oh, and then right. if, you, open art. Fantastic. if you can see the green bright circles, mm -hmm. that, is, that indicates that the ferry is sitting in the port. Cool. And the Isle of Wight is proportionally much bigger than, than um, the UK mm. mainland. So, yeah. Land, land it's land. like that, that participation um, just... I mean, in terms of participation, another piece of artwork, before we start to sort of bring this this to a, a logical conclusion, because I could talk to you about your artwork for a long time, I realise this. But the other one that I really like was, again, it's a participation. It's not a, it's not a piece that exists to put on a wall as a piece of artwork. It's not an installation that people have turned up to. This was a conversation that you had with people and just said, you know, what make gun fingers, um, you know, and everybody, uh, you know, as a child or, you know, especially. Yeah. So, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about sort of the way you like to work with people in situation. It's not necessarily a, a, or a community. If you, if you're doing a piece of artwork that is a conversation with other people, how do well, you? Well, the prompt, well, I mean, my background was a, a broadcast journalist so mm. my career before I decided I wanted to fully do art all the time was I worked in television and I was the one that went and got the interviews with people so getting an interview out of somebody or approaching people is not not a problem for me um this piece was uh as part of my MA studies we had we went to a gallery and the instructions were um look at a piece and then make some artwork inspired by the work that you saw. And there was um, a musician artist who had done, I think it was, I can't remember the ins and outs, but I think it was some kind of like beat poetry. And she had, she either mentioned gun fingers or a part of her action was that. And there was, I mean, every day there's, some reporting from America about violence. And I was doing a lot of reading around knife culture in Great Britain and guns in America, and how we all have this idea that America is so much worse because it has guns. And I was thinking, well, it kind of is. Like, it, 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 it. people have the means to be dramatically violent over there but that mm. doesn't say that that doesn't exist in other countries um i mean look at the knife crime here in mm. the uk and um it's and you know if you rep if you if you give people guns instead of knives then we probably would have the same level of massacres over here i mean there is isn't there? i mean we're you know we're recording this on august the 25th and as we looking through art pieces that you've made that are in the past, we talk about them now and, yeah. and they have a really strong current mm. resonance. I mean, there's an awful story at, in the news at the moment of a little girl that just in life was on an estate, violence springs up. So even in the UK, you yeah. know, gun crime right now, I mean, this is, you know, we, we bring it up as a piece of artwork and I sort of chose it because I love the fact that it, it every it's a collective expression. Yeah. And also, as you bring up that collective expression, there are current cultural um, threads that are going through the world at the moment of of what you can and can't talk about, what you should and shouldn't talk about, what's yeah. really relevant. And, and I also it's think really about something for me today. Yeah, and I also think about the gun thing as well. Is I mean, they say because we've Brexited now, mm. um, that we there is. Uh, there's in intel that we don't have access to mm. and you know i'm not i don't want to like be a you know doomer but 
um, you know, there might we might see more guns in the UK. You know, mm. they might get in. Yeah. Or they might not, you know, maybe we'll have better boundaries and barriers against people bringing in guns. But yeah. um, I think the thing about this piece was also a culture and the influence that America has. Um, and it, like, everybody has gun fingers. Everybody knows how to make a gun. You know, you do as a kid, you know, bang, bang, you're dead. Um, mm. There's also, there's a quite a horrible childhood thing. There's something in my childhood as well where there was a gun involved when I was about 10. So maybe mm. unconsciously I was like bringing that to the surface. But I literally just sat in the corridor at uni when I was doing my MA and I basically said, give me your gun fingers. Yeah. And people did. And some of them had like machine guns and some of them had two guns. Yeah. Well, it was we're, fun. We're... It was really fun. And, you know, there's lots of different nationalities at unis as well. So it wasn't just British people. There was lots yeah. of we're, there's going to be loads of stuff that I, I would love to talk to you about what it means to be an artist as a as a performance artist, entertainment industry. Having this insight into sort of the art world is it's it's a very it seems very contained and very unique. Mm. And, and seeing you on your journey has as has given me an insight into creativity and art. So I'm going to um I'm gonna bring us to a close now. But so um, we'll uh, we will move into the little end bit, which I'm going to clip and make available for what's coming on at the weekend. So um, if you've watched up to this point, I am really pleased to have had you watching along in the good old tradition of Twitter and Facebook and all of that sort of stuff. There is always a thank you. And I hope you really liked it. Of course, there is. If you've got anything to say about what we've talked about, if there's anything else you want to see, do comment, um, do follow and subscribe. It is the statutory thing to ask. If we want to build our audiences, um, it's really, it's really important. So to move this on to our next section, we will just pause. So Didi, you are going to be at the Wales Art Contemporary this Saturday, doing a walk and talk. Yeah, so um, Wales Art Contemporary is the exhibition and mm -hmm. it is at Wales Cathedral. Other artists are doing the other talks. I think I'm the only one that's doing a talk every Saturday. And the last one is this Saturday. I was asked uh, if I wanted to do the art tour and I wrote back and said, um, I would like to, but it kind of depends on what you want the art tool to be, um, because these are my thoughts, which is there are two things. One is I think people are terrified of contemporary and modern art. Mm -hmm. um, and from experience, lots of people who don't go to galleries um, when they come across it in another environment, just kind of go, I don't get it. It's not for me. I was very keen to sort of make modern and contemporary art more available to those kinds of people and secondly I believe as an artist we make work and we have complete conviction and we are very authentic about what we're trying to message through that work um, as best we can but I also believe that uh, when you put the artwork out into the world it then belongs to the viewer so what I do is I take people around on the tour and I basically try and get them to critique the work, you know, you know, bear, bearing in mind that they have to be respectful because every artist that puts work out into the world is kind of going, yeah, here I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they don't want people then to do is start being mean. Um, that doesn't mean to say that you have to like everything. Um, but I think meeting a work of art can sometimes be a bit like meeting a person you might be completely bowled over by them only to kind of meet them again and go, well, it's kind of, you were great when I first met you, you were quite impressive when I first met you, but there kind of isn't much more. And then there are other work, there are other people you meet and you think, oh, you're quite quiet. I don't know if I can be bothered. But then over time, if you spend time with them, you just go, actually, you're really interesting. And I think art's like that. Yeah. 
you're you're going to be there on Saturday to do the talk. How long does that talk last? The talk walk and talk. How long will you be? It take. It's an hour. And, and I have rules, which is um, you can stay for as long as you like and leave when you want. If you're not enjoying it, then leave. And you don't have to join in. And you are allowed to say, I really don't like that. But mm. then I will expect a second sentence from you telling me why. Even <laughs> if it's just, it really makes me feel uncomfortable. Oh. So there is a QR code in the top of the screen. Sign up for the 27th Walk and Talk. That will take you to the Wells Contemporary website form that you can add your name to the list. Whereabouts will people be meeting to start this walk? Um, it's, it's the first entrance as you come in. You, you, there's no other way of getting in. And then um, the volunteers for Wells Art Contemporary have done an amazing job. They've got like a stand and they will actually ask you if you want to go on the tour. You can see Hostile at Wells Art Contemporary until Sunday the 28th. I'll be joining Dee Dee to capture her walk and talk on Saturday. To book a space, use the QR code on the screen. Check out Dee Dee's site and you can find her on Twitter at DD Deborah Davis and on Insta on at Deborah Davis Art. Mm -hmm.